mileage. So the Dragon Boat holiday, which has kept Shanghai shut for three days, it kept Hong Kong shut on Wednesday. We get reaction to the declines that we're seeing across the Asia Pacific when uh, those two come on stream. Day of, uh, again, uh, these are tumbling stocks in Tokyo. Let's find out more. Here's David Inglis. Yep, and we will see, of course, Rich, uh, mainland investors get their first chance to react to all of the data coming out on the weekend, certainly everything that has happened since. Now, uh, Rich mentioned Nikkei 225. Look at that, 5.3%. Uh, we're just about at the lowest level here for the Nikkei 225 uh, since... Welcome to First Up. This is the show where we're going to tell you all about the global markets and, and what's lined up for today. And it looks like it's going to be all about the Japanese markets currently down almost 5% as fears amongst investors globally rise about Fed stimulus being pulled back. You're seeing the impact on those markets and Japanese markets right now are down cracking over 5.3%. Morning Mutali. Good morning Tanvi. We'll talk about the Japanese markets and more. Let's kick off with the top headlines. Fitch revises India's rating outlook to stable, citing the government's efforts to contain the budget deficit, says it expects India to meet its FY14 fiscal deficit target of 4.8%. In an effort to increase overseas capital inflows to strengthen the rupee, the RBI enhances the limit for foreign investments in government securities by $5 billion with immediate effect. SEBI to suggest ways to shore up the rupee including allowing FIIs to trade in currency and increase trading time for secondary market in currency. That's the Bloomberg TV India exclusive. And Asia trades weak after the World Bank cut its global growth forecast and as investors mulled the outlook for monetary stimulus, Wall Street too ended lower with the Dow posting its first three-day losing streak this year. Also on the show, we get you an exclusive interview with Mukul Mudgal, the retired Chief Justice of the High Court. He believes that independence of the CBI has been taken away by the government after Justice Verma passed away. Unfortunately, over the period of time after Justice Verma's retirement, the government nibbled away at that power of independence of CBI. Also coming up on the show, yet another exclusive interview with Derek Bandin, the head of global equities at Citigroup. Those were the headlines. Let's turn our attention to the global queues now. Tanvi, including yesterday, it was the third losing session for the Dow? Absolutely. This is the first time this year, Mithali, when that's happened. Third uh, straight consecutive session uh, where the US markets have been on the fall. And actually, if you see, this is the sentiment globally. The central banks across the globe have actually spoiled the investors in the past uh, couple of years with a huge amount of stimulus. And now that they're even beginning to consider to pull back on that or not pump Pumping in more as much money as they were, uh, you can see the kind of pessimism that is there. Nasdaq is down by over 1%, Dow Jones also below that 15,000 mark and S&P 500 also seeing a similar amount of cut. Really the pessimism uh, is, is quite, a, uh, I mean, in a really huge and significant way across the globe. Take a look at the dollar index. Uh, it's the lowest level that we've probably seen in the past two months now at 80.79. So after that huge amount of rally, there is some pullback as far as the dollar currency is concerned. Dollar versus yen, important to watch out for this. There is an extremely interesting correlation the way the yen weakened in the last few months, rather six months, and how the US markets went up. And now that you're seeing this currency strengthen at 95.06, you can see the pressure that's building on to the global markets. Uh, uh, take a look at what's happening on the commodities front. Well, not as bad as you would have expected. Brent is at 103.4. It's pretty much flat right now. The NYMEX is facing a bit of more pressure. 95.8 as far as NYMEX crude is concerned and COMEX Gold is showing some amount of revival again so 13.91 as far as COMEX Gold is concerned. It is going to be all about Asia this morning huge amount of crack coming in to the Japanese markets on the back of that strength that we've seen in the uh, Japanese currency so yen is all, almost on a two month low now uh, and you can see that almost a four and a half five percent cut actually the most recent data that we saw as far as Japanese markets are concerned. Straits Times also down by almost 1%. The entire of the Asia is currently in red with deep cuts uh, and it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime around. But let's get you more details as far as the US markets are concerned. Here's uh, Sadia McCord with all the detailed stock action. 
Hello, I'm Sadia McConville in New York for Bloomberg TV India. Another down day for stocks. Investors concerned the Fed may curb the stimulus measures that have fueled the rallies we've seen recently. And Facebook's adding a familiar feature. The social media site announced that it will incorporate hashtags into its conversations, taking a page from Twitter's playbook. Facebook says the tool will let users find topics of interest more quickly. And healthcare is a pretty standard work benefit. But how about for our four-legged family members? According to Insure VPI, one in three Fortune 500 companies offers its pet insurance to employees. Among the companies offering pet insurance in their voluntary benefit portfolios in an effort to attra attract top talent, Chipotle, Delta Airlines, and T-Mobile. Back to you in Mumbai. So there are global stimulus fears right from Washington to Tokyo still taking center stage. Like we said, the Japanese markets are down almost 5% this morning. Hear out what global experts are making of the situation. First of all, timing um, for an investor is almost impossible. So I think what we tend to try to do is to try to see the strategic secular trend. And here it is clear that the Fed today regrets that it gave an open-ended sort of commitment towards QE. It wants to, 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 to bring that role, uh, sort of roll that back. Um, this is this, what, what these comments about the tapering were all about. But I don't think that the global economy or the U.S. economy is anywhere near strong enough for the Fed really to start taking liquidity away. So I think once the markets digest that, we'll see a backing down of yields. Now, with, with Japan, it was clearly a case of better to travel than to arrive. I think, you know, the markets took, took a lot for granted. Equities moved up a lot. Bond yields backed up. But now we need to see the action. And, you know, that's going to take some time. So I think before we see the next or a resumption of the sort of risk on uh, mode that we saw in Japan, we'll, 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 we'll need to see the effectiveness of the new Abenomics policies. Now the other reason that we are seeing a global sell-off right now is that the World Bank has cut its forecast for global growth once again, saying that serious challenges still remain. Bloomberg's David Inglis takes us through the finer points of this report. It's not surprising. It's still above what China thinks it will grow, uh, at 7.5%. Uh, but I guess, you know, what's also worth noting about Asia is about Japan, because they previously thought uh, Japan would expand 0.8%. This was all before, of course, the BOJ came into the picture. New leaders there before Shinzo, Abe's, Abenomics also started to kick in. So they've revised upward what they think Japan will be worth. Well, Japan will be uh, by the end of the year. They're saying 1.4% expansion in the Japanese economy. As you mentioned, China, they've brought that down to 7.7%. Also, another big Asian economy, India, now they say will be at 5.7%. Uh, now, I guess going back to the U.S., and I guess a question now for investors in the markets, you know, will the U.S. Fed, will they or won't they start tapering off uh, QE by the end? Uh, of this year. Now, what they say is that you have the U.S. growth, they've upgraded that to 2%, but at the same time though, they're also uh, essentially shooting out a warning here, saying that the withdrawal of accommodated policy, uh, at least in the U.S., may have longer term consequences uh, in terms of interest rates in developing economies, and as you would expect, of course, that in turn would have uh, an impact on aggregate demand from a lot of these economies that depend both on the U.S. and in China. David Inglis on the global growth forecast. Well, it's now time for that promised interaction with Derek Bandin, the head of global equities at Citigroup. He believes that quantitative easing tapering will happen gradually and an economy that is strong minus the stimulus looks difficult. Recently I had a little bit of weakness, but I think what you really have is a reviving economy that's starting to get its own legs. And But as a result... I think you know people are anticipating that the uh, powers that be will start to take away some of the QE3, whether it's tapering or whatever other method people prefer. But ultimately, I think that's a healthy thing. I, I think it's actually a good sign uh, that that's the conversation we're having now. It's sort of uh, taking the patient off of the <laughs> off of the short-term medication. What's your own reading? Could it be very soon, according to you? Um, I think it's sort of over a uh, nine-month period. That, it's sort of that kind of time frame. Uh, which you're in, you're in the odd situation now that every time you get a piece of good economic news, it actually worries people because they think they think that it'll accelerate the tapering process. Um, but uh, like I say, ultimately, I think that's pretty positive. So I suspect you'll get a period here as we make a transition um, where you'll get a relatively sideways equity market. I think we've had a good move up, but then I do anticipate as the full strength of the recovery comes to bear, you could have quite a strong uh, you know, last sort of uh, you know, four or five months of the year. Uh, so anticipate an ongoing strong equity market.
We recently saw India's finance minister having to come out in markets saying that you, uh, most investors misread what the Fed uh, chairman had to say. So what you're really saying is that perhaps fears of this happening sooner are misplaced? Is that the point you're making? Yes, I think, I think that's exactly right. I think this is going to be a very gradual process. I think it's the kind of thing that the Fed will test the waters from time to time uh, you know, and see how reactions are. But I think this, this kind of thing will happen gradually. I think it's healthy that people are beginning to have that discussion now about is it time to start to taper off? Because obviously, in the long run, we all want to get back to the kind of economy that is naturally strong on its own and doesn't really need some of the exceptional stimulus that, that has been provided in the past. You can catch that entire interview right here on Bloomberg TV India, Market Guru at 8 a.m. later this morning. All right, we'll slip into a short break, but up next, after RBI stepping in to arrest the sharp fall in the rupee, market regulator Sebi could also step in to the currency's rescue. That's a Bloomberg TV India exclusive. How is the world looking right now from an equities point of view? Let's take US, for example, to start with. Are things getting any better there? I think you know, people are anticipating that the powers that be will start to take away some of the QE3, but ultimately I think that's a healthy thing. I think it's actually a good sign. How worried should India be in terms of even a small amount of this turning into an outflow? I don't really think you're going to see an outflow. I think it's going to be a matter of what is the rate of inflow. It's nothing that I think is a long-term issue. I don't think it's anything that is emblematic of a structural shift or a, you know, a significant problem. Could you explain a bit why you feel that there wouldn't be more outflow? I think you know, India is a place that definitely you know, captures people's imagination for it. it's a natural place to put capital to work. So I think you'll continue to see strong flows. CFA Institute, shaping a financial industry that better serves society. First trades every day. Every morning, rise or set on the early morning buzz. The opening bell rings and trading begins. We look up for the most relevant happenings in the stock market. Relevant to India Inc., the economy, and most importantly, to you. So join us on First Street. Presented by BSE Investors Protection Fund. It's speculative. It's an instrument to hedge your risks. And it's full of action. Welcome to the world of derivatives. Catch the entire week's action and all about FNO. Analyze the market trends and find out where the street is headed. World of Derivatives, presented by BSC Investors Protection Fund. Presented by BSC Investors Protection Fund. Welcome back. Now in a positive development, international ratings agency Fitch has upgraded India's outlook to stable from negative. It has also affirmed India's credit rating at triple B negative. In fact, Abhijit is joining us from Delhi now. Abhijit, Fitch's move comes as a big boost to the government that has been struggling to prop up the rupee. As far as the Fitch ratings are concerned, I can tell you that this is obviously a, a great bit of news coming in the middle of this entire rupee depreciation uh, saga. In fact, the Fitch ratings might uh, have a sobering impact on the rupee. Essentially, what's happened is the triple B negative rating that Fitch has uh, stays, but the uh, outlook has been revised to stable from negative. And uh, this, is, this obviously would bring uh, good cheer to Indian corporates who try and borrow abroad uh, through the ECB route or uh, otherwise. Uh, the fact of the matter is what they've predicated their assessment on is the fact that uh, it seems to be, uh, as per them, as per their assessment, 
uh, a credible effort on, on, in fiscal consolidation terms from the government of India. And uh, the trigger really seems to be the 4.9% figure that the government clocked lower than the 5.2% that was promised and delivered in the budget for, by Mr. Chidambaram. Now, obviously, they, the Fitch believes that uh, the government going ahead in FY14 can manage the 4.8% fiscal deficit target. And, of course, growth would be around 5.7%, slightly lower than 6%, but uh, still decent. I think it also uh, has taken heart from the fact that inflation in India, at least the WPI1, is, still, uh, is actually on the downward uh, trajectory. But uh, what is interesting is the timing because uh, this comes bang in the middle of this entire rupee depreciation saga and when a lot of people, a lot of analysts have said that this will complicate the RBI's efforts to cut interest rates because, you know, a lower rupee will feed into inflation and uh, fan inflationary pressures again in the domestic economy. The good news is domestic price pressures are abating and that perhaps would still keep the lid on inflation though, it, though, though nobody perhaps now expects an RBI rate cut. But again, on net-net, Good news coming in from Fitch, perhaps just what the doctors ordered as far as the finance minister is concerned. The finance minister is expected to make a, an announcement regarding measures, short-term measures to aid capital flows to prop up the rupee. Net net, good news coming right at the, uh, just a, at the right time. And uh, this is what the doctors ordered as far as the finance ministry is concerned. Thanks for that, Abhijit. And like Abhijit was pointing out, the currency trouble remains now in an effort to increase overseas capital inflows. To strengthen the rupee, the RBI has enhanced the limit for foreign investment in government securities by $5 billion with immediate effect. Shubham Batra is joining us on the phone line. Shubham, good morning to you. Uh, tell us what did the RBI come out with yesterday? Well, it was an expected move by the government at a time when rupee has weakened to record highs and that does impose a negativity on the current account deficit per se. Moreover, it is important to understand that the enhancement of the limit <coughs> for foreign investors in the government dated securities is only available only to foreign central banks, sovereign wealth funds, and other insurance and pension funds. And interestingly, the unutilized amount, which so far has been unutilized basically, will be auctioned on uh, June 20th as per what the release is. Now, in fact, as a one-time measure, a special window of $250 million will be provided for foreign investors who've exhausted their reinvest, uh, reinvestment limit. And as, as per my sources in the finance ministry, only up to 80% of the limit uh, which is available to the foreign investors has been exhausted. So out of $25 billion, that was earlier the figure, only 80% has been exhausted so far. Now, really, it remains to be seen what more steps the government will take to arrest the fall of the rupee from here on because the finance minister is due to take a press conference today at 10 a.m. In fact, just yesterday, the finance minister had this crucial meeting with the top advisors of the finance ministry, which included the chief economic advisor, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, to understand what could be the measures taken, the short-term measures to uh, sort of arrest the free fall of the rupee. So it really looks like that the finance minister is a worried, uh, worried man right now. Absolutely, Shubham. We'll, of course, keep tracking that very important uh, press conference that the finance minister will be holding today. And remember, uh, the biggest concern right now is the FII outflow, especially from the debt market. In the past 20 days or so, we've seen almost $2 billion go out of the country. And this is one of the steps that RBI has now taken to ensure that FII continue to come in as far as the government securities and bonds are concerned. Madali. Keeping the focus on the rupee, let's get you a Bloomberg TV India exclusive. Well, after the RBI stepped in to arrest the sharp fall in the rupee, market regulator SEBI could also step in. The Economic Affairs Secretary Arvind Mayaram, along with RBI Deputy Governor H.R. Khan, met the SEBI officials in the financial capital here in Mumbai to discuss measures that could be taken to arrest the fall in the rupee. Jeshri has more on this exclusive. Jeshri? Well, that's right. Arvind Mayaram, the, de the Department of Economic Affairs Secretary, he met SEBI officials along with the RBI Deputy Governor. And from what they are trying to uh, understand is that how the secondary market trading of currency could help in arresting the fall of the rupee that has been hap happening rapidly for the past uh, past week uh, from what we have seen. So what SEBI, uh, SEBI has suggested, there are three ways that could be looked at. Firstly, that the FII trading into the currency in the secondary market could be increased because earlier they were only uh, trading to hedge their position. So they might be allowed to trade in the secondary market for currencies. Secondly, the trading time for the, uh, for the secondary market of currencies could also be increased. So what will happen with this, they will, be, uh, they will get a hedge over the US and the Dubai markets because they will have more time and they will also, the Indian markets will have the benefit of arbitrage. 
Um, the third move that can be done is that the banks might also be get more power to trade uh, to trade into the currency secondary market because that will just give more debt to the market and also the exposure of the banks would also increase. So certainly these are the long term steps that SEBI has suggested uh, to uh, to the uh, Department of Economic Affairs and RBI was also there in the meeting. So there's certain likelihood of these uh, measures to come into effect. But how soon and how fast these measures will happen, that's still a point to be considered. Back to you. Well, the rupee did recover yesterday, but gains were capped. The government's comments aimed at bolstering the currency aided. It closed at 57.79 versus 58.39 to the dollar. Since May, the currency has lost 5.7% and since January, 8% against the dollar. Well, let's move on and take a look at the day ahead. What are the key events to watch out for, Tanvi? Well, Mithali, quite a few things and like Shubham was also pointing out just a while back, we will be tracking that very important press conference that the finance minister will be holding really to discuss the ways that the government is looking at in terms of arresting the rupee slide or whether or not it is even a big concern for them anymore. Cabinet is also going to consider a decree on the food security bill. So food security bill is back in the political corridors today and we'll be tracking that very closely. MMTC stake sale is today. Remember yesterday the cabinet took a call on how much and at what price they're going to sell it. They're going to sell a little less than 10% in MMTC and that OFS takes place today. And also at the Supreme Court, the PIL against Ran Baxi comes up for hearing. This was actually earlier slotted for yesterday and that got postponed today. So those are the few things that we'll be tracking. But more importantly, it is the food security bill and the way forward uh, as far as the government is concerned. And to tell us more about this, Abhijit Nyogi is uh, again joining us now from the political capital. Abhiji, tell us what else is lined up uh, in New Delhi today. Well, important day in the capital today. The finance minister is going to brief uh, the media on possible measures that the government will take to uh, prop up uh, the rupee. Remember, the rupee has been on a dramatic depreciation uh, curve going all the way uh, down to 58.95 before retracing and coming back above that uh, 58 uh, level. And uh, the finance minister has been closeted in meetings uh, all day yesterday and uh, we could expect something uh, important in terms of an announcement from the finance ministry today. That apart, uh, the cabinet uh, will take up uh, the ordinance on food security. Remember there was a lot of back and forth as far as uh, adopting the ordinance route was concerned with uh, a lot of concerns uh, being aired in the Congress party that uh, the legislative route, the parliamentary route is a better route uh, for uh, getting in a bill or ushering in <coughs> a move of this kind. But it does seem that at this point in time, uh, they are going ahead with the ordinance. There, there are still some pockets of opposition. But even if the ordinance is cleared by the cabinet, uh, it may not be immediately implemented because for implementation, you need uh, the uh, states to adopt uh, enabling resolutions in the state assemblies. And many opposition rule states may not uh, play ball. And also there are technical difficulties because there are some provisions in the bill which mandate uh, state-level constitutional bodies like the Food Commission. And uh, as of now, that, that inf infrastructure is absent. And many states uh, or bureaucrats in states have actually said that unless Parliament passes the bill proper, uh, the states wouldn't go ahead with it. So uh, the ordinance might go through, but unless it becomes a law in Parliament, the states may not play ball. So we'll keep a close watch on that development as well. Thank you, Abhijit. Let's take a quick break here. But still ahead, Apollo Tires to acquire US-based Cooper Tire and Rubber Company in an all-cash transaction valued at approximately $2 billion. And a big setback for Sun Pharma to pay, uh, to pay Pfizer $550 million to settle a patent infringement on its acid reflux drug, Protonics. How is the world looking right now from an equities point of view? Let's take US, for example, to start with. Are things getting any better there? I think you know, people are anticipating that the powers that be will start to take away some of the QE3. But ultimately, I think that's a healthy thing. I think it's actually a good sign. How worried should India be in terms of 
even a small amount of this turning into an outflow. I don't really think you're going to see an outflow. I think it's going to be a matter of what is the rate of inflow. It's nothing that I think is a long-term issue. I don't think it's anything that is emblematic of a structural shift or a, you know, a significant problem. Could you explain a bit why you feel that there wouldn't be more outflow? I think you know, India is a place that definitely you know, captures people's imagination for it. it's a natural place to put capital to work. So I think you'll continue to see strong flows. Beyond profits, beyond numbers, some businesses have a larger vision. The, the world is divided into the able and the disabled. The maintenance part, we took it as a challenge. It's about having a far-reaching impact. Our end goal is to have nearly 100,000 children in kindergarten and maybe 200,000 children more in the after-school center. Catch more special stories of entrepreneurs making a difference. A mission to redefine business. Down to Earth. watching first stop now Apollo tires drives into the United States the company is all set to buy US based Cooper tire and rubber for two and a half billion dollars in fact the deal would make Apollo the world's seventh largest tire maker and reduce the dependence on a slowing Indian auto market Ruchi is joining us from Delhi with the details of this mega deal the auto ancillary space is buzzing with M&A action once again as Apollo Tires will acquire US-based Cooper Tire and Rubber Company for about 14,500 crore rupees. Under the terms of agreement, Cooper stockholders will receive $35 per share in cash and the transaction comes at a 40% premium to Cooper's 30-day volume weighted average price. The combined company will be the seventh largest tire company in the world and will have the revenue of close to 35,000 crore rupees. Moreover, it will give Apollo Tires a strong presence in high growth and markets across the four continents. The combined company will be uniquely positioned to address established markets such as US and the European Union as well as the fast growing markets such as India, China, Africa and Latin America where they have a significant potential for further growth. Uh, the close of the transaction assumed, uh, assuming timely regulatory approvals as well as approvals uh, from Cooper's stockholders is expected to take place within the second half of 2013. Thanks for that, Richie. One of the big, biggest deals we've seen in the auto segment in the recent past. Uh, moving on, a major setback for Sun Pharma. The company, along with Tema Pharmaceutical, will pay Pfizer $2.15 billion to settle a patent infringement lawsuit. Now, this relates to an acid reflux drug called Protonix. Sun Pharma will shell out $550 million, while Teva will pay over $1.5 billion to Pfizer and Japan's Takeda Pharmaceuticals, Pfizer's partner on the drug. Jeshri has the background of this big tussle in the pharma sector. Jeshri, a big blow for Sun Pharma, isn't it? Well, that's right. It certainly spells bad news for Sun Pharma as they will have to shell out around $550 million to Pfizer in the patent infringement lawsuit. So from what we understand, Sun Pharma had kept aside around $100 million when they had lost the case in the patent war. And now they will have to cough up an additional $450 million that certainly is going to put a pressure on Sun Pharma and their books. And from what we understand, Sun Pharma was also out looking for any kind of a partner and acquisition in the pharma space. And that also will be put on dampener because of the same. The analysts are already saying that this is a very high valuation for any kind of a infringement uh, patent lawsuit. Suit. So uh, certainly this is going to put a pressure, not uh, this will send out a very uh, big message to the entire pharma industry. So just to give you a basic background about how this entire case unfolded, it was that Takeda and uh, Takeda and Pfizer were the original owners of the patent of the drug that is Protonix, which is an acid reflux drug. And from what later happened, that uh, Teva and uh, Sun Pharma started using a generic make of the same drug, and that is the reason why they lost this entire lawsuit. So certainly it is uh, indeed a bad news for Sun Pharma. Back to you. 
Thanks for that, Jashreen. Peter Payton was continued to intensify as far as the pharma industry is concerned. But uh, moving on now, a day after the CBI named Naveen Jindal in its FIR, in the coal scam case, the investigating agency has asked Jindal to return from London and cooperate with the CBI probe. Sources are also suggesting that the CBI will probe former coal secretary H.C. Gupta. Mehak Kasbekar joins us from New Delhi. Mehak, take us to the details of what you're learning on the CBI's coal scam probe. Well, things are moving very fast as far as uh, the coal uh, scam is concerned, at least with these four FRs which were filed uh, in which Naveen Jindal and of course the ex-MOS uh, of state was named. Uh, today, CBI sources tell us